the, uh, the strategy is to sample patch instances and use a planner to solve those instances offline. Then we execute the plans against the instances to construct policy state action examples for training. And the policy states might not contain the same variables as the plan states. And I'll talk about that as we go along. We then learn a decision tree classifier to map these policy states to actions, and then we evaluate the performance of the learned policy on new simulated instances, so instances that were not seen in the training phase. So to build the planning instances, we generate the patch contours using a simulator that was built by uh, one of the uh, research engineers at Embari. And this is an example of a patch that's generated by that simulator. The outer edge of that patch we call a standard patch. And then there are various inner contours determined by different chlorophyll levels. And you can see the color-coded chlorophyll levels. And red means high chlorophyll. This is uh, an example of a plan. Um, basically, uh, the patches are about eight kilometers across. So they're very large. We solve 2,000 of these. And uh, the plans are about 500 actions long. So the planning problem is to get around the patch as efficiently as possible without getting lost. And we use um, a confusion level, a variable called confusion, to model the AUV being lost. It gets lost if it wanders inside or outside of the patch. Right? And we set a maximum confusion level, and the confusion is set to zero every time the AUV crosses the edge. However, there's pressure on the uh, planner to get around the patch as quickly as possible, so it can't cross the edge at every step, and therefore, um, we end up with a combinatorial problem to solve. So the AUV can take any one of, any one of those um, five moves from any cell, and it obviously has to both keep confusion low and get around the patch efficiently. So this is a, an interesting planning problem. We solve this planning problem using LPGP, but you could solve it using any competent numeric planner. So the approach that's most similar to the um, patch uh, to the uh, plan-based policy learning strategy is hindsight optimization. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, contrasting hindsight optimization with our approach using this very simple example. So if you've got a situation where you are starting at a start state and moving to a goal and you've got two uh, actions out of the start state, then you might take action B with a cost of 40 and reach the goal with that total cost. Or you might take action A with a cost of 10 and get to a, a gate which has a probability P of being open. If the gate's open, you can then get to the goal with an additional cost of 10. But if it's closed, then you've got to go back to the start with a cost of 20 and then follow the long path so you end up getting to the goal with an overall cost of 70. So just briefly, how would hindsight optimization learn a policy to solve that problem? Starting at the initial state where you're at the start and the gate is unknown, if you take action B, then the cost is 40, so that's, that's done. If you take action A, then hindsight optimization will sample the possible states, and there will be P states in which the gate is open, and one minus P states in which the gate is closed. And in the states where the gate is open, the, plan, the optimal plan is to apply action D to get to the goal with a total cost of 20. And in the case where the gate is closed, then the optimal plan is to do C followed by B, and that accumulates a total cost of 70. So what hindsight optimization will learn is that if you take A in the initial state, then the total cost is 70 minus 50p. And if you take B, then the total cost is 40. And then by some algebra, it turns out that if P is greater than 3 fifths, then A is the best action from that state. Otherwise, B is the best action. And we do this computation of um, optimal plans to the goal from every intermediate state. And finally, hindsight optimization would learn this policy. Um, the key thing to take away from that example is that hindsight optimization samples and plans from every intermediate state. And in this example, obviously, that's no problem because there's only very few interesting uh, states to consider. But in general, there could be very, very many. And it's therefore potentially computationally very expensive to do this. So looking at exactly the same example uh, from the point of view of plan-based policy learning, uh, what we would do is we would build some number of samples, let's say 1,000 samples right at the outset. And in 1,000p of those, the gate will be open and the optimal plan will just be to do A followed by D. 
And in a thousand times one minus p of them, the gate will be closed, and then the optimal plan is to do b. So, so that's our planning phase completed, and we now play, play those plans out in simulation against the initial policy state, um, which in this case is just that you're at the start and the gate state is unknown. And in a thousand p cases, from that initial policy state, we'll apply action A, because that's what the plans tell us to do. And in a thousand times one minus p cases, we'll apply action B. And then when we apply A, we will reach the state where the gate is open, and in those cases, we'll apply action D. But we'll never meet the state where the gate is closed, because in our plan samples, we always knew whether the gate was open or closed, and if it was closed, then we never went there. So that's a missing state. So we then um, classify these state action pairs into uh, a decision tree or collection of, of uh, state action rules. And you can see from that collection there that the, the, the gate closed state is missing. So this is an incomplete policy. So the way that we address that is we roll out the policy against new samples and every time we encounter a missing state, then we, uh, we uh, adapt the policy. So when we execute action A, we'll sometimes arrive in the gate closed state. There'll be no policy action proposed, so we have to repair the policy. And what we do is we identify some default action, which is the right thing to do, uh, that will get the system back into a state where it continue execution of the policy. And in this case, the default would be to apply action C and get back to the start. So that's the rule that we add to the policy. And then we, we, re we reclassify, reclassify the state action pairs to learn a revised policy. And as a consequence of doing all that, we will learn this policy um, when the probability is greater than a half. And this is the same policy that we, that we learned using hindsight optimization. But the difference is that we learn to do this when p is greater than a half, while hindsight optimization learns to do it only when p is greater than three fifths. And it proposes b otherwise. And hindsight optimization is doing the, the right thing here. That's actually optimal. And the plan-based learning is not optimal in this case. But there are other examples that I could show you where it's the other way around. Right, so one of the critical things in our approach is that there are often observable variables that increase discrimination. So to see how this arises, I just want to add a, a simple unreliable light to the example that we've been considering so far. So suppose there's a light that can be red or green that's uh, probabilistically associated with the status of the gate according to the probability distribution there. Then um, suppose that the probability of the gate being open is now a half. Then what hindsight optimization would do is it would recompute the policy given that it now has a new variable that has to be taken into account. So it will recompute all of the conditional probabilities from this state leading to a total cost of 50.3 for action A from the state in which the light is red and 32.5 from the state uh, in which the light is green and the total cost of B is the same regardless because it's not passing through the gate. And that would cause um, hindsight optimization to learn this policy that when the light is red, you do action B, and when the light is green, you do action A. Okay, but the, the key thing to notice is that hindsight optimization has to recalculate the conditional probabilities in each state now that we've added the light. And if we added another observable variable, then it would have to do all that work again. By contrast, in the plan-based policy learning, we don't redo the planning phase. We leave that as it is, but we now play out the plans against the initial policy state, which has now been enriched with this additional variable. So now we have initial policy state that tells us whether the light is red or green. And because the probability of the gate being open was a half, in 500 out of the 1,000 cases, A was the right thing to do, and in 200 of those cases, uh, the light will be red, and in 300, the light will be green, and in 400 of the B cases, the light will be red, and in 100, the light will be green. That's, that's uh, because of the, the probability distribution that we have. But in the plan-based policy learning approach, we don't need to be given that distribution explicitly, whereas in the hindsight optimization approach, we, we do need it. So the plan-based learning strategy will then classify state action pairs into a decision tree, and you see a fragment of the decision tree there just to show you what that, what that looks like. And 
um, the two key points are that we don't redo the planning stage when we add the light, and therefore we could add additional observable variables and we would not have to redo the planning. And finally, um, this association between observable variables and actions is crucial to the good performance of our policies. And we call this step um, observable correlate learning because we're correlating observable variables to the actions that the plan have produced. Okay, so to come back to the patch, an informative set of state variables is essential to, to allow the classifier to discriminate properly between the various situations in which we should apply our actions and therefore produce a well-structured decision tree. So we did a huge amount of experimentation to come up with a good collection of policy state variables for the um, patch following case. And I can't go into the details of what these are, um, but I can just point out to you that um, a key one is the average bearing of the vehicle over the last 10 or so moves. Um, we also keep count of the number of times that the five actions are applied and the confusion level of the vehicle um, and a couple of other things as well that turn out to be very important discriminators. But what we don't bother to retain is the cell that is used in the plan state. So while the planner knows what cell the AUV is in and it makes its five moves from the cells that it, that it visits, the policy state doesn't know about the cell. Okay, so why don't, we, why don't we keep the cell as one of the uh, policy state variables? It's because we want the policy to be independent of the cell um, since conditioning on the cell would make the policy orders of magnitude larger and one of our key objectives is, is to obtain a small lightweight policy that can be executed very efficiently. So then the other question is why don't we use hindsight optimization instead of the plan-based learning approach and the message there is that well first of all I think I've already shown you that we think that the plan-based policy learning approach saves on computational effort because of not having to do planning from all of the intermediate states. But we think it's possibly true that hindsight optimization could in principle compute the conditional probabilities at each state by sampling from the simulator if it knew what the AUV cell was. But if it didn't know the cell, then it would be in a situation where it had to compute the conditional probability of being in a particular cell after the next move based on just knowing its average bearing over the last 10 moves, the number of times it turned left or right and so on. And we don't think that that would be even possible, um, certainly, certainly not um, computationally feasible. So I mentioned earlier that we have to repair the policy with default actions when we find missing state action pairs. Um, and, in the, uh, and, and this is another thing, defining a good default action is very, very difficult. But in the po patch following example uh, application, what we did was to roughly divide the patch into a grid of nine cells, with each cell being about three by three kilometers. And we defined what we call an area-based default action for each cell. In fact, there are two for each cell, one for the case where the AUV is lost inside the patch and one for the case where it's lost outside. And then when the uh, policy is under execution and there's a missing state, then we simply apply the relevant area-based default action. And then we relearn the policy. And what you see on the right there is um, an example of the repaired policy traversing an unseen patch and doing a, a reasonable job of that. Okay, so now we'll go on to talking about evaluation of the strategy. For a good evaluation, we need metrics that will tell us how well we're doing. And we also need a good non-planning opponent that we can compare with. So what we did is we defined two metrics. The first one tells us how far the patch is from the path. And the second one tells us, um, I'll come back to this, the second one tells us how far is the path from the patch. Okay, now if we Considering how far the patch is from the path, if you look at those examples at the top, on the left we have one where the AUV just does a huge kind of coverage of the whole zone. And in that case, it would get a, it would get a good score for how far is the patch from the path because the patch edge is being met very, very often by the path. Okay? The path is covering most of the patch edge, so that's good. However, it would get a bad score for the how far is the path from the patch metric because all the points inside the patch that are not crossing the edge would be considered far from the patch edge and therefore that score would be bad. And in the other case, on the right, we have a tiny fragment of path just traversing the top of the patch. That would give us a, um, a bad score for how far is the patch from the path because there's lots of patch that doesn't go anywhere near that path. 
whereas it would get a good score for how far is the path from the patch, because the path is right on the patch and where, in the small part that it actually follows. So for the uh, non-planning opponent, we used a static policy, which we call it a static policy. It just applies the area-based default action every time, never does anything else. So it does no planning, no learning, nothing, just applies that area-based default action, which is actually quite a competent behavior. And if you look at the uh, examples here, um, this is the, s the static policy versus the planning policy working on a standard patch, and the static policy is just as good. Okay, so the area-based default action is just as good as all that effort. But, of course, what we really care about is the robustness of the learned policy to other shapes of patch. So we learn the policy off these standard patches, but we want it to work on lots of different kinds of patch. So in these experiments, we devise three types of patch that are non-standard, which we call horizontal, static, and um, inner structured. And our objective, as those metrics indicate, is to get around as much of the patch edge as possible. Okay? And when you compare the static policy with the planning policy on, on the, the left here, you can see that the static policy is only traversing a small part of the patch, and then it's missing most of it. So as a consequence, it gets a very bad score for the how far is the patch from the path uh, metric, phi, and um, a much better score for how far is the path from the patch metric, omega, because it tends to follow the bit of the patch that it does follow pretty well. On the other hand, the planning, plan-based policy learning strategy is doing a reasonably good job of traversing those patches, even though they're non-standard and it learned on standard patches only. In the same way, on the right there, we have the static policy is doing um, a pretty poor job, not so bad in the top there, but quite bad down below, of just missing the patch almost altogether, as is reflected in the scores, while the planning-based policy is doing a, a quite good overall traversal job. It's not perfect, obviously. You can see that it's, um, you can see that it's not uh, ideal, but it's, it's doing a pretty good job in terms of the objective that we set. And we perform 10,000 tests over... Uh, examples of these types of patches, and those are average results over the 10,000 tests. So, uh, in conclusion, what we found, or what we think is the case, is that plan-based policy learning works very well when it would be very difficult or impossible or computationally far too expensive to calculate the conditional probabilities at the intermediate states. Um, in those cases, the plan-based policy learning, we think, saves a lot of computational effort. We also require that the sampled instances can be usefully seen as planning problems because that's the, you know, it's nice to have an interesting planning problem there so that you get the leverage of the planner working in that, uh, that phase. And then we see a gap between the plan state variables and the observable variables that actually matter in terms of execution. And where there's that gap and the, relation, the relationship between them isn't necessarily known, then the plan-based policy learning method works pretty well. So the experiments reported here were all in simulation, but as I said, Kanner introduced us to this harmful algal bloom problem, and since we did this initial work, we've now started working with them on uh, performing C tests in which we actually experiment with our learned policy, and we did this in October. And the, prom the, the initial results from the C tests were promising, um, but there were some issues to do with the fact that we're only working on surface patches, whereas actually it turns out that the 3D structure of the patch is quite important for good performance. So we're now working with them on extending the approach and that's work in progress. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the main uh, specific features for your uh, policy, right? Uh, so, we, yes, we absolutely have to define domain-specific policy state variables, yes. So, so have you tried uh, some, uh, some of the approaches like uh, Alan Fern's work on, on learning features? Uh, we certainly could do that. I mean, that what we've found so far is that it's an incredibly delicate matter to come up with really good discriminating mm -hmm. policy state variables. So I don't yet know how we would automate that process, but it would be great if we could do that because that would generalize the strategy a lot, yeah. How does, it, how does it handle uh, conflicting plans and uh, regularization? Right, so we use the uh, J45 uh, classifier from the Weka toolkit. It's the C4.5 rule learner. And we use that as a black box. 
Um, so we don't, uh, I, I can't answer the details of your question straight off the bat, except to say that we use that as a black box and what we've discovered is that the choice of variables influences how well that decision, decision tree partitions the space. And that's why we've invested a lot of experimental effort in coming up with a good set of variables. But we don't, haven't delved inside the, inside the box at all. So does it happen that uh, you have a lot of conflicting plans coming up uh, given a particular state? Uh, no, I don't think that's an issue. Um, no, I, do, I really don't think that's an issue. I mean, basically, we, we do a huge number of samples and plans, and uh, in this particular case, 2,000, but, you know, you might do 10,000 because that's all an offline process. And the way we look at it is the more plans you see, the better information you're going to get about what are sensible things to do in all the different situations. And the whole idea of the plan-based policy learning is that if you learn off enough plan samples, even if many of them are giving you somewhat conflicting information about the choice, um, you'll have seen all of the interesting situations you've got to deal with during the learning, during the training phase, and then you can just apply that knowledge very quickly in the execution. So that hasn't been an issue for us yet, but maybe it's something to look out for. Yeah. Now, I can see the computational issues that may be uh, the problem behind the optimization, but is there any fundamental due to which plan based policy construction may be better policy than uh, the optimization? Um, so, we have constructed a simple extension of that example. We just add another uh, route and it changes the, the way that the policy is constructed. We, ended up with, we end up with the optimal policy in hindsight, optimization doesn't. And I can show you that example offline. But I think that um, fundamentally, neither technique produces optimal policies. That's clear, because you can create examples where they're both non-optimal. Um, and therefore, what I would say is that uh, the, the key difference, the key issue for us is whether it's computationally feasible to do the optimal planning from every state or not. And in cases like the patch following, where the state space is massive and the conditional probabilities are just too hard to, to work out, then we think you need some other, let's say, quicker, dirtier method. I mean, hindsight optimization has the, the beauty of being a very nice uh, uh, theoretical method, but I think it's limited in terms of practical application, and that, that would be, uh, that's the only fundamental reason for using the plan-based policy learning that I can think of. Hello, I'm Hutan Nakhoz. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Alberta, and this is a joint work uh, with York Hoffman and my supervisor, Martin Mirlo. Uh, so, most of the planning applications uh, need reasoning about uh, limited resources that are available, like fuel, energy, money, time. Uh, here in this paper, our focus is on the resources that cannot be uh, replenished. A good example is uh, a task where you have a fixed budget of your resource like money and you need to come up, of plan, uh, come up with a plan to achieve your goals uh, without exceeding, exceeding the initial budget. So basically you have uh, an initial supply of the resource and your actions can only uh, consume resources. They cannot provide new resources uh, when you execute them. 
So unfortunately, most of the successful planners like Lama doesn't do very well uh, in problems with resources, especially when uh, the problem is really constrained and uh, the amount of resource available is scarce. Uh, and the main reason is that uh, uh, these re relaxation heuristics that are uh, very successful in some other domains don't really model resource consumption. Uh, and the problem gets worse here when you use uh, greedy search algorithms like uh, greedy best first search uh, because you totally rely uh, on the heuristic values and you don't do uh, explore exploration. So uh, you, uh, the, those heuristic values can lead you uh, in very uh, bad regions of the search space to, towards the e dead ends. So we can take two approaches to uh, you know, improve resource constraint planning. Uh, one possible approach, of course, is to come up with new heuristic functions that can model resource consumption. And uh, a good example of this is uh, LPR PG planner, uh, which tries to uh, yeah, consider resource consumption when they build the heuristic function. But here our approach is totally different. We are focusing on the search algorithm. We try to come up with more explorative uh, search algorithms. And uh, the approach is to try to improve this random work planner R1 to address uh, resource constraint uh, planning. So I'm going to give you a very simplified uh, uh, overview of the base planner we use here. It's a local search algorithm. It starts from the initial st uh, uh, state and it runs uh, several random walks, bonded random walks. And it uses uh, the heuristic uh, evaluation to, ju to just evaluate the endpoints uh, of random walks. And uh, for the next state, it chooses the endpoint that has the minimum heuristic value and it do, uh, directly jumps to that endpoint. We call this process endpoint search continuation. So this process continues until you find your goal state uh, or you decide to restart from the initial state. You, you might hit a dead end or you might see you are not doing uh, good progress in the search space and you decide to you know, explore a, another part of the search uh, space. So the techniques that we are introducing here are called smart restarting and unpass search continuation. Smart restarting uh, changes the way uh, the restarting is done in R1 and unpath search continuation changes the way uh, we are proceeding in the search space. So restarting is really important in these constraint problems because you have many dead end states and you get uh, usually much more restarts uh, in the search space. Here you see uh, an example from uh, trucks domain and we are plotting the minimum heuristic value reached by each search episode of R1. Each episode starts from an initial state and it ends when you restart. So you can see sometimes we reach really low heuristic values compared to the average heuristic values that is reached. But since we are restarting from the initial state and we are not learning anything from the previous runs, uh, the distribution of the heuristic values doesn't change at all. Uh, but those runs might have some good information. You, you, you might you know, make some good decisions at the beginning, but at the end by randomly choosing a very costly action, rowing anything. So uh, by exploiting the information in those runs, we can learn something. So this is the idea behind smart restarting. Uh, the idea is very simple. We maintain a pool of most promising runs we have seen so far. Uh, a run is more promising if it reaches a lower heuristic value here. And then, uh, instead of restarting from the initial state, 
we restart from a state visited by one of those runs inside the pool and we uh, choose that state completely randomly. So here we have two key parameters. One of them is, of course, the pool size, how many runs you want to keep. Another one is, when do you want to start your smart restarting? Because if you start from the beginning, it gets heavily biased towards uh, the first runs that you had. So basically, usually we uh, start with very simple basic restarting, and then we switch on the smart restarting after a while. So if you use this technique in the same problem, you usually, after a while, uh, get lower and lower heuristic values. And this is exactly what we expected from the design of the algorithm, to learn some, some, something over the time and uh, decrease the heuristic values. And you can see, usually the goal is reached uh, much faster. So this is the first technique. Uh, about the second technique, uh, in the original hour, I told you we directly jump to the best endpoint at each search step. But the problem with that is that if uh, some of the actions in the path already consume lots of resources, you are basically committed to that resource consumption, and the rest of the search is somehow wasted if you are basically in the dead end right now. So we decided to design a more conser conservative approach here to both use the guidance and uh, postpone the commitment as much as possible. So the idea is instead of jumping to the best endpoint, we keep the path to that state and in the next step uh, we run random walks from randomly states chosen along the path. And we keep updating the path after each search step until we find the goal state. So basically, uh, you have a partial path in the search space and you keep updating that path. Okay, now we have these algorithms, but uh, a good question here is how we are going to evaluate them because uh, it is really important to see how uh, the algorithms that we are testing are doing where, when the problem is really constrained. If you give infinite amount of resource to the problem, uh, uh, good planners like Lama doesn't have any problem solving the problem. They just ignore resource consumption. So just generating problems randomly is not a good idea because uh, you don't get the picture right. So. Ideal thing is to somehow control uh, the constraintness in the problems that we are testing. Uh, so Jörg Hoffman and his co-authors in each uh, 2007 introduced this notion of C value, which is the initial supply of the resource available divided by the minimum amount required to solve the task. So basically, if the task is solvable, this C value is larger than or equal to one. And if the C is closer to one, the problem is more constrained. So this is a very good idea because you can measure these C values for your problems and then you can see the, uh, the, the performance of your planner as a function of the C value. But the problem with this definition is that it cannot be used uh, for multiple resources. Because when you have multiple resources in the space of resource allocations, you don't have just one minimum. You have probably parts of minimal uh, points in, the, in, in that space. So one contribution of this work is to generalize this C value for multiple resources. The new definition we propose is, this, uh, is that the C value is the largest factor by which we can downscale the initial supply of all the resources such that the problem doesn't get uh, unsolvable. Let me give you an example here. Uh, here we have two resources, fuel and money, and the blue curve shows the parts of minimal surface here. 
So every point inside the curve represents problems that are not solvable. And uh, the points outside the curve represent problems that are solvable. So we basically we are saying that any point on, uh, on the curve has the C value 1. And then you can measure the C value, the constraintness, for the other points by drawing a line from that point to the origin and uh, finding the intersection with the curve. And then you can divide the x value of the point by the x value of the intersected point, or the y values, it doesn't matter, uh, and you get the c value. So here in this example, the c value is 1.5, and you can define the c values uh, for all the, problem, uh, all the solvable problems that you have. So let me talk about the experiments. We ran experiments in three domains here. The key point here is that in these three domains, where we have generators that you can control the C value. And we spend lots of time uh, developing uh, generators for no mystery and rovers to allow that. Uh, note that it takes time because you need to implement uh, problem specific solvers to find these parietal optimal curves uh, to be able to control the C value. But at least now, three domains are available for the community to use it. Uh, we are testing with eight satisfaction planner and five optimal planner. The reason we are testing with optimal planners is that, uh, you know, so, some of the search algorithms in optimal planning might be really useful for more constraint problems compared to satisfaction planners. But we do not intend really to compare plan, uh, optimal and satisfaction planning here. And this planner supports a wide range of uh, encodings, and uh, we uh, run on all the supported encodings. Here I'm just uh, going to report uh, the, best encode, the result of the best encoding for the planner. Uh, I'm not going into the details about the encoding, uh, but I, I just uh, mentioned this cost augmented encoding. This is a, a, an encoding which is only possible for single res uh, problems with single resource. Here, you assign the cost of the action equal to the amount of resource uh, consumed by the action. This way, some of the heuristic planners that consider uh, the cost in their heuristic evaluations might get some idea about resource consumption in the plan. So we generated 450 problems. We first uh, generated a smaller set of base problems and then just changed the C values, just the initial supply to see the effect of the C value. Uh, let me show you the result. Uh, these are, uh, so you see the, on the axis, the C value, on the Y axis, uh, the coverage. Here you see the results for the planners other than random walk planners we used. And uh, if you don't see a curve for a planner, it means it didn't solve any problem in the domain. And here we had uh, two resources, and, the, uh, and you can see the SAT-based uh, planner M is doing better than the other ones when the problem is constrained. But when we add uh, random walk planners to the picture, you can see they can do much better. Uh, the purple curve shows this new system using both techniques on path and uh, smart restarting. The black one, A2SR, just uses a smart restarting. So in this domain, just using a smart restarting is better, actually. And you see a big gap between random walk planners and the other uh, parts of the figure. So this is another uh, domain where in, in these problems we just have one single resource, but uh, the size of the problem is bigger in terms of uh, locations and other objects. You can see Llama is doing very well here, and the reason is that cost augmented encoding, because here we just have one single resource and we could use that encoding. But again, if you add a random work planning to the picture, uh, for example, on the point C1, 
C1.1, you see you go up from 40% for Lama to 85% uh, for uh, R1 plus smart restarting, which is very nice. Another domain here is no mystery. Uh, here on the right you see optimal planners. And the problem here was small enough such that optimal plans actually could solve problems here. We just had nine locations and nine packages. Yeah, this was a transportation domain. Um, and you can see actually optimal plan is when uh, the, the problem is very constrained, is better than satisfying plans. Merge and shrink solve 70% uh, of the problems. And, uh, and you can see random walk planners cannot do better than SAT based planners again here. And the, the main reason is the size of the problem. The problem is small enough such that m m more uh, systematic methods uh, scale better. But if you increase the size of the problem, uh, you can see none of the optimal planners actually solve any problem. And uh, random walk planner are really way better than the other ones. Uh, for example, for C1, uh, none of the planners solved any, but uh, this new technique, uh, using the both techniques, solved 55% uh, when C equals 1. The last domain is TPP. Here, LPG is doing better than the other ones. and. Uh, uh, the new technique uh, uh, is comparable when C is high and when C equals 1, it's better than LPG. So you see consistently when the size of the, size of the problem is large and the problem is constrained, random walk uh, planners, especially the new techniques, outperform uh, the previous planners we had here. So here we are running another experiment to see the effect of the pool size on smart restarting. On the x-axis you see uh, the pool size and on the y-axis you see the coverage and different curves shows uh, different timeouts. Uh, the conclusion you can make here is that when you have a smaller timeout it's better to have a smaller pool size to, you, to, focus, on, uh, to focus and be more greedy. If you have more time, you can have larger pool sizes and explore more. And the last experiment we are running on IPC to see if these techniques work for other domains. And uh, the result is that smart restarting never hurts. Uh, uh, actually, it leads to better results in four domains when it is uh, added to R1. Uh, but on past search continuation is really hurtful because uh, the progress in the search space is very slow, uh, even when the heuristic value is good. So in conclusion, uh, we created this framework where uh, you have uh, at least three benchmarks to control the C-value. We generalized the notion of C-value, and uh, uh, we introduced two new techniques uh, to tackle these hard problems. So as the future work, one possible way is to, uh, you know, consider resource consumption, consumption explicitly in designing the search algorithm you have. And uh, another option is, uh, of course, to come up with automatic configuration techniques to adjust parameters like pool size or uh, to decide which improvement should be used for different problems. So. This is the talk. So, so you wanted to go with the optimal planners, and, and it seemed that the C value affected them, which seems kind of strange to me because they, they're, they're going to try to solve it like it's 1.0 always, right? So, um, one effect of the C-value is that you get more pruning, of course, uh, when C is lower. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if this is useful or not. For example, in merge and shake, you don't see much effect uh, when the C-value changes. But you see, in, so I am not an expert in optimal planning, 
we definitely need to look at these things. But the search space changes for sure when you change the C value because, uh, yeah, as I said, you get more pruning because some of the more preconditions becomes unsatisfied so in different paths of the search space. Uh, two resources. I was just wondering, cost is also a resource to some extent at least, uh, or uh, it can be constrained. That is, uh, you showed coverage results, this is also uh, going into quality of uh, the solution um, that you achieve with this random walk approach? Uh, so here we didn't look at uh, the quality metric, uh, uh, but uh, the, if I want to comment on the quality of the solutions used by random walks, we have these post-processing techniques that are sometimes really helpful. I, I'll show you in the next talk. But it happens uh, in some of the domains where uh, you're right, you get very long plans. It doesn't happen a lot here because the problems are really constrained and uh, resource consumption is somehow linked to the length of the plan. But uh, uh, yeah, we didn't uh, consider the quality here. We just considered the uh, resources that you had, like fuel and energy. Uh, yes, uh, I wonder uh, what will be the performance of a simulated annealing type of algorithm because simulated annealing is another way of improving a random walk uh, kind of algorithm. Yeah, that's true. That's actually an interesting thing to see. I have a very uh, simple implementation of simulated annealing, but I haven't tested uh, on resource constraint planning. Uh, so one thing that you get uh, from uh, uh, random walks is that uh, uh, we can show that in some kind of plateaus on uh, local minima, they can quickly escape from the plateau because the density of the uh, exit points are high. And since we are not doing evaluation on every step, it can be very fast. But if you use simulated analyzing, uh, for sure you need uh, heuristic evaluation per step. Of course, you can also change that, but you get closer and closer to systems like uh, random walks we have. But that's definitely an interesting direction to investigate. where um, you have to trade resources. So the LPRPG heuristic was specially designed for this kind of thing where you trade one resource to get another resource and you, you have resource constrainedness but you need to trade very carefully like in a market type context in order to um, manage your resources well within those constraints. So I wonder whether you could try uh, a comparison in a, see how you get on in a domain where you've got those kinds of constraints happening. Yeah, we can definitely experiment with that, but uh, some problem that we have, it's, it might be hard to define something like the C value for uh, those problems to control the constraintness. Here, uh, uh, that's why we focused on uh, uh, resources that cannot be replenished, but uh, right. of course that's a, a very valid future work. Right. I was just wondering, I'm not sure I followed why multiple resources, why you can't factor that into the cost function. Uh, I mean, see, couldn't you use some uh, most constrained, the most constrained resources as your cost? Uh, uh, yeah, so the reason about that is that 
Uh, we wanted a general domain independent setting for our tests. For, uh, for sure, if you have a specific problem, you can pick one of the resources or assign a cost function, like a, an aggregation function, like the summation of the cost, uh, uh, and use it in your encoding, for sure. But uh, it will be different for different problems, right? And uh, uh, we wanted to have experiments in a kind of domain independent setting here. Well, I guess I, uh, it seems pretty general to take the, the resource that's most constrained along your path and make your But then in the algorithm, so. you should know which resource is more constrained. I mean... Uh, no, I just mean how much uh, some... Uh, how oh, can, how constrained it is on that path, basically. So um, why isn't the granular? I mean, doesn't the granularity of the actions or the amount of resources that they consume affect how constrained? I mean, this gap is less meaningful if you don't know what is the basic step, isn't isn't it? So you're saying that if. So is that, say, with respect to a particular domain? Or is that like you, you vary it only with, with a given domain? So you are saying that the amount of resource co consumed by the actions might uh, affect uh, the so result. So imagine I have a really small gap in real terms, but my actions really consume very, very small amounts of resource. Yeah, that's, uh, that affects the... So it's with for a particular domain. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is another work on RAN uh, This is a joint work with Pran Shi and my supervisor, Martin Mueller. Uh, so at the beginning, I'll give you uh, another review of random work planning tailored uh, to this talk. And uh, then I'll talk about the drawbacks of uh, this kind of problems, uh, planners, what's the, uh, what are the problems. Then I'll propose this algorithm that tries to fix some of those problems. And uh, then we will talk about the experiments and conclusions. So in the previous talk, you saw this Aram planner. Uh, so uh, the benefit of using these random walks uh, is that, uh, as I also said in the uh, uh, questions part, uh, by running random walks in certain plateaus, you can really quickly uh, escape uh, from from the plateaus. Uh, actually, we have a theor theoretical paper in SOX that, that is explaining that uh, uh, behavior and characterizes uh, search spaces and plateaus where random walks can be better than more systematic approaches like breadth first search. Another benefit of using this kind of method is that, uh, you know, each time that you jump to the end point of a random walk, you can uh, rapidly progress in the search space, uh, especially when the heuristic values are good. So this uh, uh, rapid progress in the search space is really helpful when the size of the problem is very big. Uh, I'll show you later the results, but these are the benefits of this algorithm. One problem is uh, the solution quality. Uh, Estefan also uh, mentioned that. Um, so 
In ICAPS 2010, we proposed this uh, system called ARAS that tries to improve the solutions after they're generated. Uh, one of the key ideas is this uh, planned neighborhood graph search where it uh, generates a search space around the solution such that it fits in the memory. Then you use very quick uh, optimal solver to find the shortest path from the initial state to the goal. And actually this uh, works very well for Arwen uh, in some domains. For example, in the last competition, Arwen generated best quality plans in four or three domains, or, which is amazing because this planner just does random works and it shows us that these post-processing techniques are really useful. But what are the problems? Uh, one of them, uh, we call it narrow exit path search spaces. Uh, I'll talk about this later. Another thing is that ARAS can only lead to local improvements. If the solution you have found is far from better solutions, it's really hard to, uh, to find them. So let's look at uh, this Sokoban domain. Uh, at least relaxation heuristics are not really good in this domain. And uh, you need to execute a very specific sequence of actions to escape from a plateau or to reach the goal uh, in this domain. So you should be very uh, extremely lucky to find uh, the exit point uh, or the goal using just running random walks. But if the plateaus are small enough by using just uh, breadth first search or any systematic search, you can quickly find the exit point. So one of the problems are where we, we need, uh, we have a very narrow exit path in the search space. So another problem that I mentioned is that these post-processing techniques uh, improve the solution locally. So this picture illustrates that thing. Uh, if you don't have a better plan in your neighborhood, you cannot get it uh, using uh, a technique like plan neighborhood graph search. So you should be more careful when you search for the solution. Uh, so we decided to uh, use a more systematic approach in the local neighborhood. We still have a local search algorithm, but uh, in each search step, we run a local greedy best first search. And after expanding uh, a number of nodes, we again jump to the state with the lowest heuristic value. And to benefit from using random walks, each node that is expanded in this local greedy best for search uh, also runs a random walk and the endpoint gets evaluated. So when at the end of the step you jump to the minimum, uh, you might to jump you, you might jump to the uh, endpoint of one of those random walks. So you get that, that fast progress in the search space. Another thing that we did here is to guide uh, the local greedy best first search using two heuristic functions, heuristic values. One of them is the heuristic value of the node itself. Another one is the heuristic value of the endpoint uh, uh, reached uh, from random work starting from that point. And we use a linear combination here uh, to order the openness. Uh, so. In our experiments, we use really high weights. So basically, this heuristic of random walks are used for tie breaking. Uh, of course, other schemes might work here. For example, maybe just adding a little bit random noise might also help. Uh, but we need to do more experiments here. So what are the benefits? First of all, if you have a small uh, plateau, uh, using this technique, uh, you can uh, fix that problem of narrow paths that we had. Another thing is that generally, uh, some parts of the state, uh, the plan that is generated is obtained by more systematic technique, more careful exploration of the search space, and it leads to better quality solutions. 
So, but uh, the dis disadvantage compared to R1 is that it can be slower than R1 because it expands more nodes and evaluates more nodes uh, uh, in each local step. So, I'm going to show you the results uh, in IPC 2011. Here we are comparing with top three planners in terms of coverage in, uh, in the competition. Uh, R1LS is the planner that uh, implements this new algorithm. Uh, and we are also comparing to Romer here. Romer is another random walk planner, but it uses uh, random walks in a global setting. So the colors uh, are comparing the results between R1 and R1LS. Green means better. And if you look at some of these uh, domains with puzzles, uh, kind of structures like Barman, like uh, Sokopan, you see uh, good improvement, but it's still uh, it is behind a more systematic approach, approaches like Llama. We, uh, we did something else here. We also ran Llama just using FF heuristic because both R1 and R1 LS is just using FF heuristic, and we wanted to isolate this search algorithm to see, uh, you know, what's the difference of the search algorithms. And you see, uh, in total, uh, R1LS is solving more than uh, Llama just using FF heuristic. So one thing that this suggests is that using multiple heuristic for local search might also be a very good, interesting thing to do, but uh, it's not clear how to do that yet. Uh, and you can also see the total coverage is very close to the second planner in the competition, which is also nice. Okay, here you see the quality result, the competition score result. Uh, again, you see big improvement compared to Arva in terms of quality, uh, 44 points improvement. And compared to the third planner in the competition in terms of quality, we are 10 units ahead. But compared to Lama, we are still behind. And uh, this planner uh, uh, generates the best quality here in four domains. But one thing that we notice in the IPC benchmarks is that in many of the domains, uh, almost all the problems are solved by the top planners. So this means uh, the problems are uh, uh, becoming easy for top planners. And if we need to understand something from the experiments, we really need to generate uh, larger problems. Actually, two months ago, I was running a random walk with no heuristic function, and it could solve 50% of all the problems in the IPC. So this means that we really need to, uh, you know, look at uh, other parameters in the problems in IPC and uh, scale them. Especially, we have very good domains in IPC but you don't get much if all the planners are solving all the problems. We really need to consider uh, generating new problems. So what we did is to uh, generate larger problems for four domains where the generator was available and uh, top planners could solve all the problems. Here you see the parameter that we are scaling. For example, in woodworking, the number of parts is scaled between 25 and 105, and the largest uh, value in the competition was 23. So the numbers in the par parentheses uh, shows the largest uh, number used in the competition. So when you look at the results here, uh, you can see that these local search algorithms using random works uh, scales way better than uh, the other planners we had here. Um, we also here experimented with FF and LPG because FF and LPG are using also local search, but uh, they didn't do very well. So uh, there might be something here with used random walks. Romer is also using random walks in, and it does better than FF and LPG and it only performs worse than Llama, 
but still it uses a global search algorithm. So maybe a combination of local search and random walks is really helpful to scale to the larger problems here. Um, and you can see R1LS uh, is better than R1 except in OpenStack where they are close. And in OpenStack every path leads to go and you just need to be quick to reach there and R1 is faster than R1LS. So you see a big improvement here. Uh, here we show the IPC score and one thing that I should mention is that um, for stochastic planners we have here, we average the score for five runs. So for example here you see uh, R1 LS is the only planner that solves the test but it gets 0.40. The reason is that it doesn't solve it uh, every time. So sometimes it gets the score zero. Uh, so if you look at the pictures, uh, R1LS is the best in elevator and woodworking. Uh, in OpenStack it is good, but after a while, uh, R1 can only solve the problems, and uh, uh, so R1LS is worse here. And in Wizital, uh, as long as Lama solves the problems, it solves it much better than random work planners. But after a, uh, a while, uh, Lama couldn't scale and uh, didn't solve uh, problems. So, the main contribution of this work is this strong new algorithm that scales very well uh, with size of the problems, at least in the problems that we tested. And another main contribution, I think, is to motivate and develop a larger problem set uh, for the uh, competition and uh, these uh, domains are available to the community to use them and run experiments. Uh, so, as a future work, you know, uh, because these random work planners have a, a totally different nature compared to, you know, Llama and other top planners, they are an ideal choice for a portfolio. Uh, and actually we did that in the last year for multi-code track using Arwant and Llama and the result uh, were, was very good. Uh, actually we won the competition with that. And uh, another idea that I showed you, uh, the results suggesting is to use some mul uh, multiple heuristic evaluation for uh, local search. Uh, which sounds very interesting to do. So, that's it. So that, that shouldn't drop in performance for Lama from 100% right coverage to zero, uh, right? This is the score. So on the x-axis you see, uh, so basically we have 20 problems in this domain and uh, the problem gets larger and larger. And then you see the score obtained by each planner for each problem. Yeah, so and the reason it goes from one to zero is that uh, uh, it doesn't solve the problem after that point. But is it because, uh, for example, it could be a grounding problem. Is it a grounding problem? Like uh, is Lama, Lama is not able to ground the input in a given time uh -huh. window? No, I don't think so because uh, R1LS and R1 also use the same post-processing of uh, fast onward frame, um, pre-processing of the fast onward uh, framework, the translation and grounding and stuff. Okay, so it's not a grounding problem. No, it's not. also comment on this uh, scaling up problems uh, so just on open stacks because that's the one I know something about I mean even if you scale up the number of products to you know any number you want 
finding a plan or finding a solution to the underlying OpenStax problem is still trivial. It's absolutely trivial. I mean, you, you can just write down a, a linear algorithm for generating a solution. Finding a good solution is non-trivial, but it depends on other parameters than just size. So it, it depends on, you know, specifically how products distribute over orders and things like this, and essentially on the path width of the problem. So in these, uh, when you generated these, what did you do with the other parameters of the generator? Uh, so basically, in this research, we just chose some parameters. We didn't uh, cherry pick uh, these parameters for our algorithms. We just uh, look at the description and f uh, you know chose some of those parameters and scaled them. Of course, you can scale other parameters, and it would be actually very interesting to see uh, how the performance changes. And uh, you're right, there might be many uh, domains where you can write very straightforward uh, problem-specific solver that solves the task immediately, but um, yeah, yeah for example, Lama, mm, I don't know, it doesn't solve it. It's, uh, it. it's true that the solution can be obtained rapidly, but we also expect from our domain-independent planners to do well in these domains also. <coughs> so, uh, given that the graph of Lama looks like either heaven or hell, um, should remember that uh, that basically means that if it passes the grounding and starts the search, it fails at the first iteration of Lama, which means it is GBFS with FF. And if Sylvia is here, and the Lama is heuristic, sure. Oh, okay, then, then that's strange. We should see. I don't, I, yeah. Hello everyone, um, this is joint work with Manuel Braun, Johannes Garimord and Malte Helmert. My name is Jendrik Seib and in this talk you will learn how to win the next IPC. So of course this is what everybody wants and uh, we want it too. So we had an idea and we implemented it and compared it to the winners of the last IPC sequential satisfying track. You can see here five of the six best contestants in uh, last year's competition. We have the two auto-tuned um, fast download configurations that were tuned with the Param ILS parameter configurator. And then we have two portfolios, the Stone Soup portfolios, um, that use various fast download configurations in a portfolio. And lastly, the winner uh, was the Llama fast download anytime um, planner. You can see on the y-axis the achieved quality in the, uh, in the track. Uh, we had 280 problems and if a planner solved all of these in the best known way it would get 280 points. So you probably thought that uh, Lama is just unbeatable 
but actually we found if we combine the first two ideas, the tuning and the portfolio method, we can actually beat Llama uh, significantly. So how did we do that? Um, we thought that the, uh, these two approaches, when used um, by themselves, have significant shortcomings. For example, the tuned planners tuned for the complete benchmark set um, that was available at the time, and they got to just one single planner. Um, and the portfolio planners had to manu manually select their components, and the times that were used for each planner were calculated greedily. In our approach, we tune one planner for each domain in the training set automatically and then evaluate multiple portfolio generation methods for this. So this takes me to the uh, outline of my talk. I will first explain how we did the domain tuning for um, a selected set of domains in the training set and then how we learn um, a portfolio of these configured planners to perform well on an unknown set of domains. We chose 21 domains from former IPC uh, challenges, uh, from the challenges from 98 to 2006, and we deliberately left out the ones from 2008 and 2011, because many of the um, 2008 domains were later reused. And we tune fast downward with the param ILS parameter configurator for each domain separately. What can we configure in fast downward? Well, for satisfying search, we used five different heuristics. The FF heuristic, the HAD heuristic, the causal graph heuristic, the context enhanced additive heuristic, and the landmark heuristic. We have two types of searches, eager best first search and lazy best first search. We can choose which type of landmarks we want to use how the costs are handled, and if we ignore or respect the preferred operators. Left alone, these options can um, be combined in numerous ways, um, but even um, they have numerous conditional parameters. So in total, uh, we have a configuration space that is as big as 2.99 times 10 to the 13 configurations. So this is a huge space. Nonetheless, Param ILS lets us find a, um, a fast configuration uh, even for th this big uh, space. The trends found during the tuning were as follows. Almost all of the um, planners use preferred operators. Um, lazy search is vastly preferred over eager search and most configurations use either one or two heuristics. We found that the FF heuristic was used the most, 12 times. After that, the landmark heuristic, 11 times. Then the causal graph heuristic, the context enhanced additive heuristic, and uh, one time uh, even the HAD heuristic was used. So let's have a look at the numbers. You can see here on the left side, we have the domains that we tuned for. We have the planners on the right side that were found for these domains. So, and we, uh, the numbers stand for the number of solved problems in each domain. So if tuning works, we would expect um, that the diagonal has the highest numbers in each row. And that is indeed the case. You can see, um, for example, in optical telegraphs, the planner that was tuned for this domain solved 21 problems while all the other attuned configurations only solve up to at most four problems. In other domains, uh, it works equally, equally well. Um, for example, in Pipes World ta Tankage, um, our the tuned planner solves uh, 42 problems, while the others um, solve less problems. Uh, all of the others solve less. In other domains, we are we uh, can obtain the best planner for this domain, but the uh, change, uh, changes are not so significant because the domain is just too simple. In total, um, all of the 21 um, configurations found on the diagonal, 18 are the best in their row, and those, uh, those three where this isn't the case, uh, we are just off by one. So tuning works very well, and um, 
this indeed shows that the domains are really different and it might make and it makes sense uh, to use a portfolio and how can we generate a portfolio of these um, found configurations um, okay so this is where I present seven different portfolio generators that um, allow us to learn a portfolio their input is the set of planners and the results on the training set that we've just seen and we give them a total time limit which is normally 30 minutes and the output is just an assignment of planner to number of seconds that uh, we run this planner so the first one is actually the uh, portfolio generator that was used by Malta and Gabi to generate the stone soup portfolio and we include it here to compare it to uh, the other generators. This portfolio generator uses hill climbing in the portfolio space by starting with the um, empty portfolio where all planners are run just for uh, several se seconds and then it generates a list of successes by raising um, each planner separately for a fixed amount of time, G, and then choosing the best um, performing portfolio. So which portfolio actually, if we run, uh, ran it on the um, training set, which one would perform best. We choose the best one and repeat the procedure. Okay, then we have this uh, simplest portfolio. This is the uniform portfolio where we just run all planners for the same amount of time. If we have 30 minutes available and 21 planners, as in our example, we, get, um, we give every planner 85 seconds. Then we have the selector portfolio. This is a brute force approach that for all subset sizes from 1 to 21 computes the best portfolio with equal time shares. The next one is the cluster portfolio generator. There we use the k-means clustering algorithm to find k clusters of planners. And we cluster a planner by um, looking at its quality of uh, each problem. So we want to have uh, in one cluster the problems that perform equally, equally well on a group of problems. And from each cluster we choose the best planner the, uh, with the highest quality and give all the planners equal time shares. Another um, portfolio generation method is the increasing time limit generator where we um, initially set the time limit to zero then raise it iteratively and find the problems that can be solved in that time limit. So um, we set it to five seconds, um, ch uh, see which problems can be solved, then find the planner that solves this um, fastest, these problems fastest, and give it the time it needs to solve these problems, and then we repeat this procedure. We do this until no more problems um, can be uh, solved anymore, or until the time limit is exceeded. The next um, generation method is called domain-wise. There we try to um, be as um, uh, to raise to um, to raise the performance for each domain um, separately, um, but by uh, looking that each domain is equally um, looked after. So. We look at all domains and see how well could I solve this domain if I had unlimited time for all planners and how well is it solved with the current portfolio. We find the domain where this difference is greatest and then choose the planner that um, makes this difference, uh, difference smaller, so solves the problem fastest for this domain. We give it the needed time again and um, then we repeat this procedure until either the time limit is reached or all domains are solved um, as good as possible. The last um, portfolio generation method is randomized iterative search. This can use any existing portfolio as initialization. In our tests we use the uniform portfolio. It generates a list of successes by either swapping time, a fixed amount of time between two planners 
or by select uh, com um, or by collecting time from all planners and assigning it to a single one. Then it commits to the best found um, successor that, uh, or to the first successor that improves the score, and we run this procedure until uh, this the score stagnates for twenty thousand iterations. So um, everyone is interested how well do these perform um, on the um, benchmark set, and we uh, have to keep in mind uh, these are new domains that we haven't trained on. Um, this is the IPC 2011 benchmark set um, for the sequ sequential satisficing track. On the left, we have the uh, real contestants um, in, the, in this track. And on the right, we have the se seven portfolio methods that we generated. These uh, results are for 30 minutes. And we can see that no matter what portfolio generation methods we choose, we are um, not only better than uh, the, the individual ingredients, the tuning or the portfolio method, but we even outperform LAMA by a significant um, score. And what is uh, also interesting is that the uniform portfolio actually performs best. So if you have 21 planners, you all just run them sequentially and give them the same amount of time. The interesting question is then, does this only hold if we have enough time available? So um, if we have 30 minutes, maybe um, this is sensible, but what is happening for smaller timeouts? And we tried this for one, three, five, and 15 minutes as well. And it shows that the uniform portfolio outperforms Lava even, Lama even in um, the three minute setting. And um, the other portfolios, if they have less time, are even better than the uniform portfolio. And even if we have just one minute available, um, we are still better than Lama. However, we can see that uh, if we have less time available, there are also less planners in the portfolio. And we um, can see that no portfolio dominates all others for all timeouts. However, we can say that cluster and increasing time limit are always among the best performers, while randomized iterative search seems to be too prone to overfitting. We used this method also for optimizing configurations and had promising initial results. Um, the next step might be to adaptively select the next configuration while the portfolio is executed and uh, to use more heterogeneous planners. For example, this time we only looked at planners from the fast downward code base, but we expect our results to be even better if we use more heterogeneous planners. We encourage everyone to uh, apply this automatic portfolio diversification method uh, also in other uh, fields because we think if you uh, use a broad range of planners or algorithms, you might po um, perform uh, better than just just one method because of the uh, because the domains are probably very different. So we have seen that on the one side tuning for domains is very effective, and if we combine those um, the, uh, found planners in a portfolio, we get very good results. So if you want to win the next IPC, I would recommend to obtain a large set of diverse planners and combine them in a portfolio. Thank you very much. I have three questions, actually, but I'll, I'll try and choose just one. Um, so uh, I thought there was work in Kevin Leighton Brown's group on a system to automatically configure a system in such a way that it would work well in a portfolio. Maybe the system was called Hydra? I, I can't quite remember. Do you, had you thought about using that work rather than doing your own thing? Um, yeah, we, uh, we had a look at that, but... Um yeah, we just wanted to roll our own, um, I guess. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say much about that. Yeah, okay. uh, so w what was the target of your uh, tuning of Prem LS? Okay, um, our target was to tune for speed, um, obviously. 
um, because tuning for quantity is much d more different, um, much more difficult because uh, you can't cap the timeouts as, uh, as well. Uh, tuning for speed is much easier for Param ILS um, because you can uh, adaptively reduce the timeouts and uh, thus obtain a faster tuning. So in our experiments, um, it was uh, okay to just f tune for 40 CPU hours at most uh, for each um, domain. And then uh, we actually used five different tuning runs for each domain. And after at most 40 CPU hours, all those tuning runs converged to uh, almost the same configuration, differing only in very minor parameters. Uh, your technique is actually very close to what I did uh, with Yuri Malitsky and Manuel Zelman and Serra in Ikai 2010 called Isaac, which is similar to Hydra, um, it, but it actually works with clusters. So you actually already have kind of the components in place to use this. So I was wondering if maybe you would think about taking your clusters and tuning parameter, uh, using a parameter tuner like ParamILS or GGA, whatever, and tuning those clusters and seeing how, what kind of, what comes out of that. That's how the Isaac system would work. Uh, okay, I have a couple of questions. So you have this huge space of uh, configuration, right, of the parameter. So first question, are those LAMA 2011 exist in that space? Uh, no, actually not, um, because LAMA uses um, uh, a very um, sophisticated approach and we ha had to manually uh, reduce this um, configuration space. So actually what you can do with um, with fast download is just unbounded, but uh, we had to restrain ourselves um, to, uh, to uh, we had to restrict ourselves to just using, um, for example, um, two open lists and not uh, not more, and just um, at most one search because uh, we wanted to combine many um, planners uh, later. Uh, this is why we tune for speed um, also, and w w this is why we only use one search. For example, Lama uses uh, many um, repeated iterative searches. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, and the second thing will be: uh, it will be interesting to know if one of the 21 planets that you got actually beats Lama 2011 across all the benchmarks. Uh, right. That would be interesting. But I don't think. Uh, I mean, just to no. just to know if you are starting with a set of planets that contains a planet that beats Lama 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I don't think this is the case. Um, I would be very surprised if uh, that was the case. I'll, uh, I'll actually ask a question on behalf of Chris Beck. Uh, he, uh, so you seem concerned about not having the right features in order to do algorithm selection. Um, but uh, Chris Beck had a paper a while back on like low knowledge algorithm control or something where you just look at some very superficial feature like uh, how is my heuristic doing, uh, you know, is, are things improving during the search and if some algorithm, some planner looks like it's performing badly then you switch to some other one that you think might work better. So there are sort of low knowledge ways of trying to do algorithm selection and maybe they involve online features but uh, so do you really think that uh, it's hard to commit? 
Um, no, I think actually uh, we have some uh, initial results where this kind of technique works well, even uh, with our found planners. But um, yeah, we were, um, I think we were just satisfied with our results. If this method just works well, why uh, invest time to, uh, to do even more sophisticated things? Jendrik actually tried exactly that for optimal planning, um, like looking how do certain algorithms perform and then after a while deciding which one to, to keep working with. And that, that works very well. Um, in satisfying planning, it's not really clear where you are. In optimal planning, you know like, okay, my F value is like 311, that's better than 270. In satisfying planning, you know nothing. The planet like, always tells you, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be done eventually. Uh, just, you know, let me do my thing. So we, we don't have a progress measure of that kind in, in satisfying planning, I think. Would be nice to have one. So are all the searches that you use just greedy best for searches? You, you, you don't use the bound from the previous solution or something like that to, to improve? Um, yeah, that's the implementation detail. It doesn't change very much if you leave it out, but actually you're right, we use um, pruning um, fa be based on the best found um, plan, yeah. Okay, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna close the session with two remarks of my own. Okay, any protests? Okay, first about these features, I actually have this torchlight tool that computes a very informative feature for the relaxation heuristics, just to mention that point, that you could perhaps use, I don't know. Uh, the other point is all you're talking about in next IPC makes me feel like we should create a uh, um, protected area for non-portfolio planners, but maybe I'll just leave that to, f to you to think over and let's have lunch. Okay. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh,